and I'ma get it right. Get on sight like. Pick down and I'ma get it right. Get on sight like. What's up guys, welcome to Vintage Genetics where it is all about classic bodybuilding and today is going to be a lag day, something we keep focusing on whatever, whenever we're training, the entire body. For me the legs are very important, which is why the leg workouts usually take a little longer because a little more rest is needed to really recuperate in between the sets to make the most possible gains and uh, towards the contest coming closer and closer being five weeks out it's time to add some intensifiers as well so let's get started with the first movement the hamstring curl the laying hamstring curl because the hamstrings will always be a weaker point so we have to make sure they are as least weak as we can possibly make them so let's do this So starting out with the laying hamstring curl is for me always a staple in each of my leg workouts. So one time I do it with both legs at the same time as you can see here and the other time I do it unilaterally and that is literally be my leg workout start for at least one and a half years. So ever since um, you know, the off season after doing the Romania Pro in 2019 that's when I started to implement more and more dominant hamstring movements. So one of the best movements that there is for the hamstrings is the laying hamstring curl. We're also going to do another hamstring movement later in this workout. But John Meadows is someone who I've been following for quite a long time. And he is a very big advocate of doing these leg curls like this, especially going to all out failure on this movement. Now, the best and most important aspect about this machine, this exercise, is the stretch at the bottom and the contraction at the top. As you can see, the hamstrings go through a full range of motion. And studies, literature, even though most bodybuilders don't care much about literature, they do say multiple times, times and times again, that the stretch in the hamstring curl machine, that is what causes most of the muscle growth. So the bigger the stretch is, the better it is for growth. So don't stare blindly at the weight used. You have to stare by recording yourself at how much stretch is the hamstring undergoing when doing this movement. And obviously you can fully stretch it, but you also have to be able to fully contract it to go through that entire range of motion. That is what it's about. So this is the first uh, working set. And the working set means that I go to failure. Now, sets to failure are sets that will cause the most muscle growth. So whenever you go to failure or very close to failure, that's when the muscle can't do any more reps properly. So I hit failure when I say, okay, the next rep I'm going to try and do won't have correct form anymore or won't be a complete range of motion anymore. That's what I call failure. And when that happens, the brain and the muscle basically you know there's a signal there that will cause hypertrophy which is a daft word for muscle growth so you want to do as many sets quality sets close or to failure as you can while keeping your form intact now there's also something like recovery of course you can't do 10 sets on the same exercise to failure because then you can't recover and we all know in the gym we destroy the muscle and outside of the gym that's when the muscle grows and recovers to get stronger for the next workout so i personally when i start a new workout split i start with two uh, working sets, so two sets of failure, one uh, lower rep and one higher rep. Now I'm doing at least three working sets and sometimes even four working sets. I'm doing four right here because my hamstrings need a little bit more volume to grow. As I mentioned, they are the weakest point in my legs or my entire physique. So the hamstrings can always use a bit more volume if that is the case. 
So the first two sets are the heaviest sets. Then the second uh, two working sets, they are the lighter set. So the third working set, I divided the two here. So first go to filler with a lighter weight, hitting failure, and then doing a drop set, which causes even more blood in the muscle, even more fatigue in the muscle, and causes a bigger signal for muscle growth, but make sure to fully stretch that hamstring at all times. Okay, the hamstrings are nicely warmed up and pumped up, so there's a lot of blood in the muscle, and now it's time to stretch them out with the stiff-legged deadlift. I'm using it in a Smith machine to stabilize the weight and it makes it easier to actually make that stretch without having to balance the weight. Especially at this point in prep, I like to use the Smith machine and other machines quite a lot more to provide stability and still target the muscle just as efficiently. So let's do that. So this is the second hamstring movement we're doing today. And I, you know, I train legs twice a week. And once a week, I do this movement. So this is a stiff legged deadlift in the Smith machine. I like doing it in the Smith machine because it allows me to really focus on the stretch and a little bit on the contraction at the top. But here, as opposed to the laying leg curl, the contraction is not as important as the stretch. Now, here's why. If you already pumped up a muscle such as the hamstrings, then it is best to stretch it out again because the, be the bigger the pump, the better the pump, the better the stretch will be. And as I mentioned in the first exercise, it's the stretch signal that causes the muscle growth signal. So you want to go to the maximum amount of stretch and then, of course, go through a full range of motion. But if you go up too high and pause there, the tension is lost on the muscle. And what is also a principle of muscle growth is time under tension. So if the tension is lost, you lose time on the tension. You want to keep the muscle under constant tension. So if you see here, the bar goes below my knees until I feel a full stretch in the hamstrings. And where I feel the stretch is all the way from my the back of my knee and uh, under my glutes. I feel the stretch through my entire hamstrings. That is what you want. And the best way to achieve this is not to think about bending down with your back, but, uh, but actually bending, I mean, pushing your hips backwards. So basically pushing your glutes backwards automatically uh, puts your body into this position and it takes pressure off of the lower back and onto the hamstrings. That's where you want the tension to go. When I did this exercise in the past, especially when having done it with a free weight movement, just a regular barbell, I found it much more difficult to focus on the hamstrings before my lower back gave in. My lower back has always been a weak point, not in terms of muscle mass or strength, but in terms of taking over the movements, being fatigued, getting a pump, getting lactic acid there. Now, that has always been the case. So I had to find a way to make it easier to get into the muscle where I want to get and not into the lower back because that is reserved, of course, for a back workout. So that's also why doing a leg curl first, getting those hamstrings pre-exhausted is a very smart tool to use um, and when doing these stiff leg deadlifts, because then you can actually feel the hamstrings much better. So if you have a poor mind-muscle connection, always do an isolation movement first before moving to a bigger compound movement like this, where you use a lot more weight and it's going to be more difficult to get into the muscle that you want to target. Now, the weight here is heavy, but not exceptionally heavy like some of the other guys do on YouTube or Instagram. What I'm really focusing on here is a full stretch. I'm not using my back to lift the weight. It really is the hamstring stretch and then using the glutes to push my hips back forward to keep that motion intact. So I don't want the lower back to be involved. So what I'm doing is I'm going as low as I possibly can, which, you know, the bar keeps going lower and lower as I stretch out the hamstrings more and more. So when you have tight hamstrings, I really don't recommend trying to go as low as possible from the get-go. What I recommend then 
is trying to go around knee level, then the neck set a little below, just get used to the movement because you can easily injure yourself if you uh, let the weights force you down instead of your own flexibility. So you want your own muscles to be capable of going down and be flexible on their own, because sometimes the weight is so heavy, you will simply go down past what you can actually do because the weight is forcing you there and that is not true bodybuilding that is simply letting the weight control you instead of you controlling the weight okay we just finished off the hamstrings very important at least one every two leg workouts i do two hamstring movements first before even starting on the quads so of course, the first movement will be the ATX belt squat, just a regular stance, starting the whole legs, but going as deep as I can to maximize the stretch in the quads and the glutes. And the more you stretch out those muscles, the more they will develop and grow in totality. So let's get started. Okay, so after having focused on the hamstrings purely, they are nicely warmed up and nicely attacked for maximum muscle growth. Now it is time for the ATX belt squat. And trust me, if you've seen my leg videos, you know, it's very rare to see me not doing the belt squat because as I mentioned in the previous exercise, my lower back is a weak point in exercises for the legs in general. So whenever I can exempt the lower back from doing anything, I take that chance, especially because I'm a bit taller than usual. I am 6'3", officially measured last year at the Olympia. So that's what I'm going with. So let's hope that height remains intact. But when you are a bit taller, and combined with a poor ankle flexibility, when you do a back squat or anything that loads on top of your back, trying to go through a full range of motion with the legs, your lower back is going to try and compensate for your ankles. So if you go all the way down and your ankles can't uh, go through any more flexion or stretch when you reach that maximum and you still want to go down lower that's when your lower back starts to compensate to keep the center of gravity in the middle and that is not what we want we want the legs to go through a full range of motion and the lower back to remain stable steady intact not being involved because again we're not training the lower back we want to attack the lower body not the lower back so what i'm focusing on here is going below parallel that is very important in years ago videos i used to say well if you go to 90 degrees that is okay too but now i have definitely changed my mind now that i see how easily it is possible to go past 90 degrees because the lower you can go the more stretch the quads and all of the other leg muscles will experience and i've said it multiple times the better the stretch the bigger the stretch the more of a response there will be for muscle growth because you will stretch you will pull literally pull more on the muscle fibers they will experience more tension through a full range of motion so more muscle fibers will be engaged and will be working to make that weight go up and that's when you get more complete legs and my legs have improved tremendously compared to years ago when i look at pictures i'm surprised at you know the weak point that my legs were they were never exceptionally weak but they weren't any way of a strong point either so you have to be honest with yourself if you're a competitive bodybuilder or you want to be you know if you want to create and sculpt the perfect physique you have to look at your body and if you subjectively think okay every single muscle group i train just as hard but i still have a weak point somewhere look at your execution because you may experience the intensity as the same but if the muscle itself doesn't experience that tension in the same way as the other muscle groups it simply won't respond in the same way as the others do so if you have a good back a good chest good arms but your legs are weak that simply means that all the other muscles do go through a greater range of motion compared to the legs and this movement this atx belt squat has allowed me to realize that it is very possible 
Now, obviously, um, the belt squad itself is not the only thing that made me realize this. I also am wearing uh, heightened squat shoes, so weightlifting shoes with a heightened heel. That also allows for greater range of motion because then my ankles don't have to stretch or flex as much compared to wearing flat shoes or regular shoes. So that definitely helps as well. So here I am making sure that I go as deep as I can. The calf is touching the hamstring and that literally physically limits my range of motion there. And that's when I know I hit the muscle correctly. So again here, the first few working sets were very heavy. And then as I progress through the working sets, I go lighter and lighter to make sure I hit more reps to get as strong as possible at as many rep ranges as possible. So that's another tool in your toolbox to use to make muscles grow that might not grow as quickly as you want them to. All right, so the belt squat is done. Three nicely intense working sets and now it's time for the hack squat so another squat variation which feels um, even better honestly if you do it as a second movement because now the quads are already pumped up and the stretch here just feels really amazing uh, no pain on the knees we're also using reverse bands here to alleviate the pressure at the bottom and uh, that also saves the joints the knee joints so uh, all on the muscle let's do this Okay, now this is another awesome movement. We all know this one, the hack squat. So the hack squat is just an amazing version of the squat. If you have a correct hack squat uh, with a good plateau or platform, you can put your feet in such a way that you can still hit that full range of motion without impacting the lower back. I keep mentioning this, but it's very important to be able to focus on the legs without your the rest of your body being in the way you don't want to be distracted there's a lot of people who are into using enhancements enhanced supplements for example who get lower back pumps very badly because they hold a lot more water stuff like that and whenever an exercise targets the lower back a little bit too much you can literally see them lay on the floor lay on the ground hoping that the lower back lactic acid goes away and the legs haven't even reached that point of failure yet so that's a big shame if that happens to you you know it happens to naturals as well if you uh, have a deficiency in taurine or potassium for example or magnesium or any other of the minerals that causes muscle relaxation but that's for another video so here i'm doing the hack squat and if you look at the hack squat there are two uh, resistance bands attached to the hack squat and they are reversed band which means that the lower i go the harder the bands pull me up again so that's caused i mean i put those bands there to lessen the stress and the tension on the knees what we want as a bodybuilder is to put all the tension on the muscles and not on the knees themselves not in the joints so this really helps with hack squats it helps with smith machine squats sometimes for people it helps with the bench press as well if they have uh, elbow issues i personally don't but in an exercise like the hack squat sometimes when you go all the way down and your knees are under such tremendous pressure you are more distracted by the fact that you want to protect your knees and the actual exercise to go to failure on the quads and that will be a shame as well so i don't feel my knees here at all i don't even wear knee sleeves here sometimes i do but i don't even need them because with the atx belt squat the knees are very much protected and with this exercise with the reverse band technique they are very much protected as well if you want to know more about reverse bands i do have a video up on my youtube channel that uh, is called how to eliminate knee pain during uh, leg workouts so reverse bands are an incredible way to make sure that the exercise becomes more manageable you can still load a lot of weight on a muscle but don't impair the joints at all okay upper legs done now it's time to quickly finish off the calves the seated calf raise 
Uh, for everybody who has weaker calves, I recommend doing standing calf raises and seated every single time you train the legs and even on other days like a back day for example, as frequent as possible. But for me, the calves are a strong point, so I only need one exercise for the calves on each leg workout. So let's get started. You know, sometimes a leg workout doesn't have to be difficult at all. It's all about the basics. No weird stuff needs to happen to make those legs grow. So this um, exercise, I mean, this workout, it really was a simple one. So we just did two hamstring movements because that's a weak point. So if you have a weak point in your physique, if your weak point are the quads and the hamstrings are quite strong, I recommend starting with a leg extension or a sissy squat, for example, to make sure you target and specifically isolate that weaker muscle before moving on to the compound movements for overall leg growth. And then we did two exercises that I feel very well. So my opinion is this. If you have the choice to do either two exercises you feel very well and do a little more, more sets there, or three exercises and reduce the volume per exercise with one of the, those exercises, you do feel, but it's not as good as the other two. I recommend doing less variation and more volume on those exercises you have a good mind-muscle connection with. To me, that is much more valuable than thinking you have to do all kinds of different movements just to get those legs to grow. It is important to hit the legs from different angles, but in my opinion, doing two heavy, serious compounds with a full range of motion is more than enough to make those legs grow in every single way. If you pair those movements with a few isolation movements to target weak points. So of course, this is not the only leg workout we're doing. Um, you know, a few days later, at least four days later in the week, I do another leg workout where I do unilateral laying leg curls and leg extensions and for example, a Smith machine squat and maybe a Bulgarian split squat, for example. So different movements again, which again, I do log and make sure I hit those three working sets again, two heavy working sets and the last working set, a lighter weight to be able to hit that rep range of 15 to 20 reps. So I hit the muscle from as many different volumes and rep ranges as I can, at least the rep ranges that, that have been proven to build muscle the most efficiently. So you can try and go for 30 reps, but in my opinion, that is not practical because you will stop because of the lactic acid before actually going to muscular failure. So very short about this movement. I'm only doing one calf movement at the end of each leg workout because my calves are a strong point. So I'm doing unilateral seated uh, calf raises. For people with weaker calves, I do recommend using the standing calf raise as well to make sure you get full and optimal calf development. Okay guys, that was the leg workout. Simple yet effective for growing the legs and working on the weak points and not working as much on the strong points to you know give the limited amount of energy in the day the limited amount of recovery you have only to the muscle groups you want to improve and the stronger muscle groups will then maintain and even improve a little bit but it's all about fixing and making those smaller weaker muscle groups bigger I really want to thank you for watching. Thank you for the incredible support at VintageGenetics.com where you can get this oversized old school t-shirt, for example, and many other old school clothing items. Thank you for watching and don't forget to stay golden.